Meet Davis. Hi. Davis is from Pollock, South Dakota. Yep. We took Davis from Pollock to fish for Pollock in Alaska. Sure did. The same wild-caught Pollock in a McDonald's filet of fish sandwich. Uh-huh. There were boats, nets, waves. And fish. And some delicious filet of fish sandwiches. So you could say Davis is one Paul lucky guy. Good one. Thanks, Davis. Catch some Pollock of your own with McDonald's filet of fish Fridays. Just $1.99 for a limited time. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or any combo meal. Blog Talk Radio. Hello, folks. How are you doing? I hope you are doing fantastic. I know I am on this Saturday. I almost wanted to say Sunday as uh, every, uh, the rest of the week has been flying by, but it's great to be here with you on another Saturday and to have another great guest that we'll talk to in a few seconds about uh, what she's doing and how she does it. And, um, and of course, she's a Harlemite. But I want to thank you for tuning in this Saturday. Uh, it's been a little while since we've been together, but it's great to be here. And it's obviously me, Danny Tisdale, on the Danny Tisdale Show. And today we have a great guest. And before we go there, I want you to check us out on HarlemWorldMag.com, uh, also on Facebook and Twitter at HWMag, and also at Harlem World Magazine. And you'll be able to uh, listen to this uh, interview we're about to do uh, in seconds again. And also, uh, she's an author. You'll be able to check out her book. Uh, and without further ado, we want to welcome our guest, uh, Brooke Olby. She is a Harlemite who is a, also, also a winner of the 2017 Harlem Book Fair's Wheatley Award. We certainly want to congratulate her for that. Uh, her work has appeared in Ebony, uh, NBC News.com, the Los Angeles Review of Books, uh, Teen Vogue, uh, Mary Claire, and many, many, many more. Her thesis for the New School's MFA in Fiction program, which became a book, which became the book, a dis. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you now, I've been destroying the name of the book, and uh, thank God she's here because she can straighten me out. Uh, and was a finalist for uh, the Fulbright Fellowship last year. She attended Columbia University in Paris uh, for the Callaloo Journal of African Diaspora Arts and Letters Workshop at Oxford University. Uh, in her other life as a host of uh, media shows, and uh, and as an interviewer, she has interviewed some of uh, our Harlem faves, favorites, Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Maya Angelou, Aretha Franklin, Felicia Rashad, Patti LaBelle, Sissy Houston, and you know, I'm just mentioning a few of them, uh, but let's talk to her now. Brooke, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Danny. Thank you so much for having me. So... Uh, Without further uh, delay, how does it feel being uh, a Wheatley Award winner for your book? It's amazing. So I actually grew up, you know, getting it, getting books that had the Phyllis Wheatley seal on them. Um, so <laughs> as a self-published author as well, it's just it was amazing for me to receive that, you know, validation um, from the Wheatley Awards uh, for first fiction for my very first novel, um, Book of Addis. And, you know, it's just, it's such an honor. I really am overwhelmed. So before you know, I, I talk to you about the book, why do you think the book has gotten so much traction, especially since you're, you know, it's the first, first, first? Yeah. Um, so, Honestly, I think um, there's a lot of, of talk about dystopias, right? There are, there's a lot of interest in uh, sci-fi and fantasy and, and alternative history stories, um, particularly mm. within the black community. We have a tradition in the black community of writing alternative histories, writing speculative fiction to, to cope with um, racism, to cope with um, misogyny, and specifically misogyny targeted towards black women. So, you know, this book kind of encompasses all of those things. It taps into that, um, the, the feeling that people have of wanting to understand their history by reimagining it, um, by creating a better way forward. 
Um, and so I think that's what people are really excited about the book. And that, that makes me happy because that was my intent. That was why I wanted to join this tradition and write this book um, so that it could be healing for me, but also for, you know, uh, our community. So I'm, I'm really happy that it's been resonating and that more people are finding out about it, especially when we have these, um, you know, the Game of Thrones um, creators who right. are trying to create this Confederate show um, that's receiving a lot of backlash from people. Um, so, you know, it, it's great that um, we were starting to see more stories written by black people about black history, um, reimagining our history and, and plotting a better way forward. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm glad to be, I'm glad to have contributed something that people find um, valuable. Well, uh, what's great is that, uh, uh, you know, what you're saying makes complete sense and we certainly uh, want to, uh, 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 I'm going to use the word escape uh, and, uh, and, and find other realities uh, and to find more about our reality, and especially in the times that we're in. And, um, and like you said, it's, uh, uh, more and more media platforms are made available for stories to be told. Uh, tell us a, a, a little bit about the book. Sure. So Book of Addis. Um, is about a 17-year-old enslaved girl named Addis. Um, she's enslaved to the first president of this country, America, and um, mm. she uh, escapes from him and is and sparks a revolution. Um, so it's a three-part series. So this is the mm. first book in a three-part series um, that kind of imagines, you know, what would have happened if someone like an Oni judge who was enslaved to George Washington um, had, you know, if people had known that she escaped from him and actually got away with it and lived the rest of her life into well into her later years, a free woman, um, you know, if people had known about that, how that might have um, emboldened them as they were rebelling um, and may have possibly, you know, been successful. So I'm taking this real history of Oni uh-huh. Judge and George Washington and Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson and all of these stories um, that we don't, uh, learn about in school and and trying to uh, bring them all together into the same timeline, um, bring all these inspiring figures um, throughout history into the same world at the same time, and there's just, just seeing what would happen, you know, what would it take to make a, a revolution successful for enslaved people. Fantastic, and, and I, I love the uh, idea of reconceptualizing history based on real history. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, but I'm curious um, that, you know, Brooke of how I, you know, and I, I, I love the idea behind the book, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, as an artist, I'm interested in, you know, uh, process and how, uh, you know, as, as a fellow artist, you get to where you are. So um, what informed you as a, uh, uh, as a student let, uh, before you were a student uh, to get to this place where you are now? Uh, was there someone that inspired you, you know, conceptually, where did this all kind of come from uh, to where we get to the, the book of Addis? Sure. So my mom actually was uh, a huge part of um, just instilling in me a love for reading um, and a love for reading, particularly black literature. Sounds like a mother. Um, Sounds like a mother. Yes. Uh, she had me memorize poems from the book, The Black Poet, <laughs> um, the anthology that was edited Go by ahead, Dudley mom. Randall. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that was the first time, you know, I'm reading Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar and seeing them, you know, writing in the vernacular. These were educated men and they made a political choice to write in the language of their people of their time um, and, and not, you know, write necessarily in standard English. Um, and that it became poetry. It was it was beautiful um, and it was validating. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the language that we speak. So that, you know, played a huge role, you know, later on in my life when I decided to write this book that, you know, if it's going to be um, written about enslaved people, that the narrator should also be speaking in uh, the, this black vernacular. 
Um, and right. that it would also send the message that, you know, the narrator of a book is, you know, considered the God of the universe. They can see everything. They're in everybody's minds and all of that. <laughs> and so I wanted the God of this universe to be on the side of the people, to be one of the people. And so, you know, that was really, really important to me. So it definitely started there. Um, when I was at Columbia University in Paris, um, I was studying the Negritude Movement, studying its creator, um, Amy Césaire, um, who, you know, was just created a, an amazing, amazing epic poem um, that also took uh, the colonized language that was put upon him, the French language, um, and he wrote this epic poem breaking the French language, basically to show, you know, uh, you don't own my tongue. Like, you took me from my family. You took me to Paris to learn how to be a good Negro, yeah, and and come back, you know, to my home in Martinique and and teach other people how to be good Negroes, and I'm not going to do it, you know. You, you, You force this language upon me, but I'm not going to take it as my own. You know, I'm going to uh, be revolutionary, not only in writing about revolution, but writing about revolution in a revolutionary way by creating new words, by you know, breaking syntax and all of that. So um, that was a huge inspiration for me. I actually have um, on my website, um, bookofadisyllabus.com has a whole list of all of the materials, the books, um, the videos. Um, the movies, documentaries, all of that, music that I listened to while I was writing the book. Um, so all nice. of that is there. But there's, there's so many uh, people, um, so many women, so many men who contributed uh, to my understanding um, of black liberation and inspired this book. And it sounds like, uh, do I hear the phone ringing in the background that uh, Oprah's going to be calling you soon to uh, make this into a movie? Don't you hear a phone I ringing? would love that. I would love that. I know that. you I'm would. <laughs> I would love that so much. Oh, I thought there was something ringing in the background. It might not be her yet, uh, but uh, I, I can see it because, uh, matter of fact, I can see it because I want to see it. Uh, it sounds fantastic. And um, press on here uh, as, as time flies by. Um, when did you realize? We'll stay kind of going back to go forward. When did you realize that you had some, you had this this talent, and writing was the platform for the talent? Um, I, that definitely goes back to my mother as well, because my father was in the Air Force and, um, you know, created this very economically stable environment for my family. My mother was able to stay home and just pay very close attention. Um, and I know that that is just a privilege that not everybody gets to have. So I'm just so appreciative that she was in that position and chose to do that for me. Um, and right, so she right. always encouraged my writing. I was, you know, in kindergarten writing like 10 page stories um, when the assignment was to write a page or a paragraph or something like that. And so, you know, she always encouraged that. And even when I went off to college, I really wanted to go to law school and be a lawyer. I was going to be the first black female Supreme court justice. That was my goal. And she was like, no, you should go to, you should study journalism. You should, you know, focus on your writing. And I just was completely Hmm. over it really until I did get to law school. And I was in, um, I was accepted into uh, the legal writing program at Mercer University School of Law, and that's Mm. when I started to get back to, you know, how empowering it is to write, Um, and so I started a blog, you know, while I was in law school, then I killed it, and then moved to D.C., trying to work for Obama, and um, I didn't get in the White House, but I got pretty close. Um, to working alongside the White House on policy issues, which was really great. Fantastic. Um, but I was writing Ooh. somebody else's voice, you know. So mm. I started my own blog right. again when I was in D.C., got a couple of awards for that, and then I just decided, you know, I, I should do this, you know, full time. So I quit the uh, law firm job in D.C. and moved to New York to get my MFA and work on this book. So, and then, yeah, the rest is, that was 2012. Uh, graduated with the book in 2014, published it in 2016, and yeah, that's that's pretty much how that happened. And, and Brooke, the uh, book is self-published. Yes. Or no. So okay. you can get it, it on Amazon. You can get it on BookOfAddis.com, um, uh, Barnes and Noble. You can get it anywhere. You can have it um, ordered at your library or um, your Barnes and Noble store. Um, it's it's available anywhere. Search for it on Google, wherever it is. And, folks, uh, once we do a wrap on our show, our podcast today, we'll obviously post a link 
uh, for the book on the site, and uh, and obviously you have an opportunity to listen to uh, the interview again, um, if you want to, that is. I'm sure you want to. And, uh, you know, Brooke, I also wanted to ask you, you know, uh, we, of course, know this book and love this book. What are some of the upcoming projects that you're working on? I know that uh, uh, off-air you mentioned that you're heading to Atlanta for a book award. What else is going on in uh, on in your life on the book side uh, projects? And I know the uh, Atlanta Award. Yes, I'm very excited because um, not only did the congratulations, Larry, the Phyllis Wheatley, thank you so much. I, not only did um, the Phyllis Wheatley Awards honor me uh, with the first fiction award, um, I got a fiction award as well from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. And so hmm. they're having a ceremony during the National Conference of Black Librarians um, next week in Atlanta. Um, and so the award ceremony is going to happen at the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American History and Culture at 8 o'clock in Atlanta. Um, and that's open to the public. So if anybody out there listening is in Atlanta next Thursday at 8 o'clock, you can just come on next by. It's, it's a free ceremony. Um, so yeah, and there's going to be some really, really cool people that I don't know if they're actually going to show up or not, but some of the other honorees are Jacqueline Woodson, who won the National Book Award uh, for Brown Girl Dreaming, a favorite of Obama. Um, so Clint mm-hmm. Hill mm-hmm. Uh, won for poetry. Um, Margaret Lee Shirley won for um, Hidden Figures um, for nonfiction. Oh, nice. So right. yeah, it's, there's some really cool people um, who are also going to be honored, and I hope they show up so I can meet them. Um, and that's fantastic. Working on the sequel um, right now. That's the so this is Book of Addis is a three book series. So I'm working on the sequel Wait, right now, which will be Brooke, out in 2018. Brooke, hold, yes. hold on, right there at the sequel, and I'm going to take a quick station ID so that our listeners know they're listening to the Danny Tisdale show and they're listening to a great conversation uh, with uh, Brooke Obi about her uh, book Book of Addis, whose name I've been destroying. Uh, <laughs> since uh, our interview. And uh, as I said, you're listening to the Danny Tisdale Show on Harlem World Radio. And uh, stay in contact with us uh, at HW Mag, at Harlem World Magazine, and of course uh, on our website at harlemworldmag.com. And we're back with uh, Brooke to talk about her incredible work that she's doing and the sequel, right, Brooke? Yes. So the sequel um, to Book of Addis, Cradled Embers, is Book Mm. of Addis, Burning Plains. Um, So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, Now we're getting right into the revolution and how that actually works. Um, We're looking at alliances, um, you know, how um, Africans can uh, work with Native Americans, um, can work with, you know, uh, Mexicans like how, can work with Caribbean uh, uh, black American or blacks in, in the Caribbean. Like how can all of these groups, um, indigenous groups in, in Canada, how can all of these groups come together and find work a common together. purpose mm-hmm. in order to not be colonized um, and enslaved? So that's, that's what I'm working on right now. And it's, it's very interesting, very exciting um, just doing the research. So. So how far in advance do you work? Uh, are you, uh, I'm just imagining the the conceptual process is that uh, it sounds like you've probably been working on this sequel probably last year, and this year you're probably working on the sequel to the sequel. Yes. So um, it, it, it's a, a lot. <laughs> Where does I it actually, end or does it? That's, they all really – overlap honestly and I yeah. before I, yeah. I finished writing the first book what I did was actually outlined all three books so I could see where like the the skeleton of where I wanted these books to go mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. And, the, and the themes um, all, all the books are broken up into four parts um, so I, I separated out the four parts of each of the three books um, to tell the story that I wanted to tell um, and then of course as you go along uh, and do more research and have more experiences and that kind right. of it can shift and change and all that but I have a rough it, it, outline right. more of is revealed all. yes yes um, you know so so that's kind of how that goes um, 
So, and if I have an idea for book three, I can start writing that. You know, I have a place where I take notes for every every book. Um, so okay. if I something you know moves me, if like one of the characters just starts talking <laughs> to me, I I need to transcribe it. You know, then I will go do that. You know, even if I'm working on the second book, you know, I will put it aside and and work on this if that's if that's where the characters are in my mind at the moment. So yeah, it's kind Love of all it. over the place, Love but you know, as I set deadlines. You know, I just I just try to make sure that I, I meet those deadlines. So people are expecting the second book to come out in 2018. I need to be ready. And you right, be ready to make it come out in 2018. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I kind of like process. So uh, I know how you work, and I know that you're working because you just described it, and I know that you're uh, doing all this media for the book. So that's outside and in addition to your timeline and your hit list. So uh, how do you uh, – what do you do for downtime to keep the creative juices flowing? Does that make sense? I think um, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually – I try to, I mean, sometimes it'll just be something that's completely random. I will be trying to relax and then, you know, I'll have an experience with somebody or, or something and then, you know, I'll just get right back into writing mode. But I actually just went to uh, Hawaii for a story um, that I was writing um, for another publication that I worked for. And But while I was down there, I got a chance to meet, you know, with some amazing um, indigenous Hawaiians. Um, who informed oh, my? Yeah. Who are informing the the writing of my story? Um, one of the women, mm-hmm. um, her name is uh, Hina Le Moana, a Wong, and she um, was in the doc- Netflix documentary uh, Kumu Hina, and so she's talking to mm-hmm. me about you know she's a, a teacher down there. She teaches um, Hawaiian language and culture. She teaches hula, mm-hmm. all of that, and so they just have such a similar story, you know. Um, right. And colonists right. came to Hawaii and basically yep. stole that land as well. And so they just have a similar story of oppression and, and reclamation as well. They are in this really exciting time right now where they are putting their kids in Hawaiian immersion school so that they're learning Hawaiian mm. language and they're learning the culture and, you know, from a very young age. And so now you have kids walking out of school who know more than their parents and grandparents ever knew. Um, so knew about their own history. Exciting, right. Exactly, yeah, because it was banned. It was actually legally banned. Um, to Sounds very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm just learning from that too, and so that's why it's so important to me to form these, you know, alliances to see, you know, the connectivity between all of these different struggles. That our struggle is not our own struggle, but it intersects with other people's struggles. And so, how can we work together um, to get the the freedom for all of us, and not just for some of us? Well, you know, it's funny that, uh, and I love love history, and history is one of my favorite subjects. But uh, it, it always seems to be the case that you know we, you know, typically have more in common uh, with each other than the difference. But it takes, uh, you know, either uh, the creative hand, the writer, the artist to bring out that difference, uh, that uh, will bring out that similarity within that difference because uh, of what he or she sees. So I I love where you're going with this. And, uh, you know, we're down to our last, uh, what, six or seven minutes. And I wanted to ask you, uh, we have a a large part of our demographic are mothers and fathers, and they may be listening with, uh, you know, maybe next to their kid, son or daughter, what advice would you give to that mom or dad who's listening and maybe to those young writers on, you know, uh, um, who want to follow in your footsteps? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I would just say, you know, as a, a parent, caught you off guard. Huh? Thing, I like that. Uh, <laughs> well, the thing <laughs> that really was beneficial for me about both my mother and father who edited this book for me, they read this book at every stage. Uh, of the conception, <laughs> and um, they just kind of, you know, they, they pointed things out to me um, that they thought, you know, I should be aware of, but they didn't mm-hmm. tell me what to write. They didn't tell me, you know, they didn't try mm. to uh, inhibit my creativity, and so for parents, mm. that was so important for me, you know, just to be able to, to have that safe space with them, to have that trust there that, like, yes, you can um, – you know, create a a kind of a safety around your kids who are trying to um, be creative, um, but to not limit them, you know, to not 
um, be afraid of what they might create. Um, I know that that was a, a really big issue kind of for my parents too, like, oh, well, what are people going to say? You know, you're talking about, you right. know, actually killing the first president. That's dangerous. You know, what if people say this or that or, you know, they, they take it the wrong way or you know, something like that, you know, and um, not don't let your fear uh, inhibit what your child can do creatively um, because there is something really powerful, I think, in letting a child explore and letting mm-hmm. someone, you know, just get out their own feelings and express themselves the way that they need to express themselves and to, to not be, not to learn to have fear, particularly when it comes to creativity. We should be aware. Um, we should be cognizant of, you know, the impact, you know, that our words have because words are very powerful. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, not to be so afraid um, to try something that it actually cripples your creativity. And that, that actually causes blocks. It actually makes you want to never write again, actually, if you're going to be that crippled with fear. So I would just say um, to, to not let anything kind of stand in your way because I actually was rejected by every major publishing house and some small ones as well for uh, over a year. Um, I pitched this book to so many people, and they just said it's not going to sell. It's not, you know, uh, it's a good story, but, you know, we don't – we just can't see this on bookshelves. That was one of the comments mm-hmm. that I got from somebody. We can't see this on bookshelves. Well, now you can. I mean, uh, because I didn't let anybody tell me no. Um, my, my book Get is on bookshelves, you know? Yeah. 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 So um, if you have something that you believe um, and you're really passionate about, um, to not let the people who reject it define what that thing is for you. Um, because, you know, it's not for everybody. It's fine. Right. You know, your rejection hurts and it feels really personal, but um, there's a, a part of you that has to learn to not take that feedback personally, you know, right. understand that everything that you do isn't going to be for everybody. And that's okay. You just need to find your people. And it's taken me uh, a couple of months, um, but, you know, within my first year, I've got these two awards. I've been featured in all these great places. Um, I'm talking to you right now, Harlem World Mag. Like, and so it's just, you know, you're going to find your people. So don't give up. Don't be discouraged if you haven't found them yet. That is uh, excellent advice, Brooke. And, and uh, I, I see why you're having so much success because I can tell that you're not going to let anything stand in the way of what you're doing. And uh, <laughs> your parents have created a great, uh, built a great foundation within you uh, that you'll build on. And, and uh, you know, we can hear it, I can hear it. So I uh, uh, can't wait for the future, even though I'm loving the present. Um, so uh, let's circle, let's complete a circle and come back to Harlem. What's your favorite, as a Harlem resident, what's your favorite place in Harlem? If you just have one My, place that you can say. Okay. If I just have to pick one place, then I have to say the Schomburg Center. I actually just got back okay. from a talk on, <laughs> on Thursday. Um, there, um, they were talking about um, the relationship between um, Dutch and African oh, that's right. people. Oh, that's and, right. Um, yeah. And so it's just, there's always that's a something Dutch amazing here, uh, happening. Uh, panel discussion, correct? Was that the, uh, yes. we posted something on that a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yes. And it was, it was amazing. They're amazing. Um, so I just, everything about the Schomburg Center is just awesome. I mean, if you're, if you're in New York, even for just a little while, I mean, just make it to the Schomburg, even if you can't see an event, um, then you can just go to check it out. Shop. You can check out the research library. It's just a really special, amazing place, and I'm so grateful for it. Brooke, thank you. Uh, we are down to our last couple of minutes, and uh, this is just as important as all that we've discussed. Can you give our, our listeners and readers uh, uh, either contact information to stay in contact with you or our hashtags for the book so that they know where to get it and they can kind of touch base with you and send you some shout outs, uh, ASAP. Yes. Thank you so much. So you can follow me on Twitter at Brooke Obi. Um, you can follow the book at book of Addis. 
Um, you, the hashtags I'm using are get with Addis and hashtag join the revolution. So yeah, I'd love to have you join this right. conversation. Right. Um, the reading while black book club is actually reading book of Addis, um, for the month of August. And so during nice. lunchtime, we're always tweeting about the book. Um, so just come on and join us. That would be great. So I, I just wanted to make sure, did I hear you correctly that we're talking about a trilogy uh, yes. I, cause I think I heard you say that you're on, on, on paper, it's three books. Is that, that's correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure, uh, so that when Oprah calls you that they've got the budget right and, <laughs> and they'll, they'll be on point. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Brooke, I want to thank I you. Appreciate it. Thank you uh, for being on the show and uh, really look forward to uh, your future work. And we may want to circle back to you and, and do some other things with you. But thank you for being on this podcast. We love it and uh, uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny and Harlem World Mag. Love you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And thank you, folks, for listening. And uh, we will be in contact with you. Uh, in minutes. Don't forget to hit us up at harlemworldmag.com, uh, HW Mag, and uh, uh, where else? Any place else I'm not thinking of? Just go to Google, put us in there, and you'll find us. Talk to you soon. Bye. What gives a happy meal its smile? Is it the delicious four-piece chicken McNuggets with no artificial colors or preservatives? The kid size fries? The apple slices? Or the low-fat milk? Maybe. But we think what gives a happy meal its smile is watching the whole family enjoying a meal. With a McDonald's Happy Meal, everyone enjoys together. Just $3 on the all-new one two three dollars menu. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. What gives a Happy Meal its smile? Is it the delicious four-piece Chicken McNuggets with no artificial colors or preservatives? The kid size fries? The apple slices? Or the low-fat milk? Maybe. But we think what gives a Happy Meal its smile is watching the whole family enjoying a meal. With a McDonald's Happy Meal, everyone enjoys together. Just $3 on the all-new one two three dollars menu. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal.